A Better Amish Life, a special edition of the Amish Bonnet Sisters, written by Samantha Price, narrated by Stephanie Dillard. Chapter 1 With a knapsack full of her most necessary items slung over her shoulder, 17-year-old Wilma Hines walked as carefully as she could across the floorboards. Inch by inch in the darkness of night, she crept closer to the door, closer to solving all her problems. If only the night wasn't so still. Her mother was a light sleeper, and if she woke, Wilma's life might as well be over. She made it to the front door, and then with a glance over her shoulder, she clasped the round door handle and turned it. Grateful, she'd thought to oil the hinges and the entire doorknob assembly, Wilma pulled it toward herself, stepped out into the chill of the night, and silently closed the door. She heaved a sigh of relief when she was halfway down the driveway. Tomorrow they'd see the note that she'd left, and she hoped they'd believe it. An owl hooted and stopped her in her tracks. When she saw the bright eyes staring down at her, she smiled and kept going hoping the owl was a sign that she was making the right decision. She was really doing this. She'd made it out without someone telling her she wasn't allowed. She was over having restrictions put on her life. But in a way, she wasn't brave enough to live on her own without the structure that was the framework of her Amish community. She mused about her whole life being full of contradictions, she made her way up the quiet country back road. Wilma had to rest. She leaned against a fence post that was close to the road. The baby was so high up in her belly, she often found it hard to breathe. All she had to do was make it to the phone, two miles from her house. She'd call her sister Iris, and she would come and get her. Then all she needed was for Iris to go along with her plan. If not, if Iris said no she'd have to develop a second plan and do it fast. Wilma made herself continue, placing one foot after another until she got to the public telephone. All the while, she prayed that Iris would have her phone switched on. Chapter Two Earlier that day, Wilma sat at the breakfast table with her mother, silently worrying about her fast-approaching due date. Wilma, I hate to have to say this, but look at you. Wilma looked down at herself. Had her mother noticed she'd gained weight? What about me? I'm your mother, so I can say this. You're a plain woman. A man's not going to choose you over anyone else. If Wilma hadn't been two weeks away from giving birth, her mother's words would have upset her more. I'm plain? You must know that. It's not only your face. It's everything about you. You look older than your years. And lately, something's been wrong with you. Wilma sat up straight so her mother wouldn't see her growing belly. If Mom discovered that, Wilma knew she would be thrown out of the house and disowned forever. That was a far worse fate than being shunned. There's nothing wrong with me, and I've always been pleased I look older. You also don't know how to act around the single men. I just want to be myself. Please don't do that. Mom shook her head. I wouldn't suggest that if you ever want a husband. I do have a solution to your problem, and that's why I'm telling you all this. I'm only 17. I've got years before I have to worry about a husband. With your looks, you'll have to get started before the girls your age even think about it. Wilma sat and listened. She had no choice. Until now, she never realized how little hope her mother thought she had. Go on. Listen to me, would you? Mom took another mouthful of tea. I am. You're getting just like Iris. You say you're listening, but your eyes tell me you're thinking about something else. Her mother slammed her hand on the kitchen table. 
Wilma's baby kicked hard in objection to the sudden noise. It was hard not to touch her belly when that happened. I am listening, Mom. Wilma focused all her attention on her mother, looking at her intently to avoid another outburst. I'm going to do my best to find you someone suitable. When I choose him, you must take heed. Okay, Mom. Okay? Is that all you've got to say? Yeah, I want to get married. I do. And I'm interested to see who you choose. Mom stuck her nose in the air while her finger ran around the rim of her teacup. People are starting to talk about you. Wilma gulped. About what? Mom fixed her beady eyes upon her. Someone said you were in town with an Englisher. At first, I didn't believe it. But now I'm starting to wonder. You have been going to town an awful lot lately. You have one excuse after another for getting out of chores and out of the house. Wilma laughed to cover up the lie she was about to tell. I know exactly when that was. I wasn't with him. It was at the farmer's market, and her mother waved a dismissive hand in the air. Spare me the details. I know you weren't doing anything you shouldn't. I raised you to know right from wrong. You're not like your runaway Schwester. When you marry, I'll be able to rest knowing I don't have you on my hands anymore. I know, Wilma pouted. She never knew she was such a burden. Your father was upset by that man who came here looking for you. I told you, Mom, he was mistaken. He had to be. I think he met Iris once, and she told him she was Wilma. Mom shook her head. Is there anything that girl wouldn't do? Wilma did her best to stifle her smile, glad her mother believed her story. It was Gerald who'd come to find her. Thankfully, she had been out at the time. As soon as she found out she was expecting, she stopped seeing him. Then the love letters started arriving nearly every single day. Even though she never answered, they never stopped coming. Weeks ago, he'd come to the house. Gerald was such a dynamic man, with such a bold personality, that he'd talk her into marrying him and keeping the child. All Wilma wanted to do was turn back time and not tell the lie that she'd told him. If he had known she was only 17, he wouldn't have pursued the relationship. Finally, she wrote, telling him she was marrying an Amish man. He'd soon give up, she figured. That was when he'd come to the house. She'd decided that a life with Gerald wasn't for her. He deserved someone so much better than she, Someone on his level was what he deserved. A plain girl would never fit into his extravagant lifestyle. How would she know what to say to his equally privileged friends? Wilma figured it was best to hold close to her heart what they'd had, rather than try to hold on to something that would eventually sour. Sour like three-day-old milk left forgotten in the hot summer sun. What are you daydreaming about, Wilma? Her mother would never know how wrong she was about her. She had attracted a man, a man who loved her. How she wished she could tell her mother that a successful and wealthy Englisher had chosen her, wanted to marry her. She couldn't. It was forbidden, and she knew a man like Gerald Braithwaite would never join their community. He didn't even believe in God. Wilma had managed to fool herself for a while, told herself he'd come around if he loved her. She even prayed that God would make a way for them to be together. But it didn't happen. Best to stay in her own lane, and that meant to stay with people she knew in her Amish community. Gerald had been a mistake. It was the baby that mattered now, not her life or Gerald's. Now her sole focus was on setting things right. Out of thin air, Wilma had an inspiration. Did I tell you I've been talking to Iris? Her mother nearly choked on her tea. She placed the cup down on the saucer. What for? 
I told her about the man that came looking for her the other day. She didn't remember him. Anyway, she's considering coming back. Mom laughed. You're in a funny mood today, Wilma. I'm trying to have a serious talk with you about your future, and you talk about your no-good sister. In a small voice, Wilma asked, Don't you want her to come back? I don't think she ever will. Maybe she's trying to draw you away with her. Keep away from her. Nay, Mom, I can't. Someone has to keep in contact so she will feel better about coming back. I said she won't. I'm usually right, except when I'm wrong, and that rarely happens. Nay, I know you two more than you know yourselves. Mom pressed her lips together as she folded her arms. I don't know why Gott wasn't nicer to me. I look at other people's kinner, and they're a joy to their parents. I get stuck with the two of you. Wilma's father walked into the kitchen at that moment. Dulcie, that's unkind. Well, she can't give me any grosskinner. Iris is ruled out. Now all I have is her. I will have some kinner, Mom. I know I will. The girl's only young still. Her father sat down at the table. Make your father a cup of tea, Wilma. Her mother pursed her lips. Iris can't have kinner since that incident. It was an operation, Dot corrected her. If you allow me, I'll go see Iris, and that's all she might need to return. Dot shook his head. Nay, if you have to talk her into it, it'll do no good. She'll need to come back by herself. If she wants to live here, I'll have to think long and hard about that. Wilma's mind flashed back to the enormous argument Iris had with their mother the day her sister left. They were always arguing, but that day was the worst. Wilma leaned forward and placed her hand over her mother's. Mom, I think it's something I need to do. Her mother recoiled from her touch. And your father said no. Stop thinking about people who don't deserve it and think about finding a husband. No man will come to you. You'll have to go to them. Maybe there's a shy man somewhere. I want to stay in this community. That might not be possible. I wrote to all my friends from across the country. No one has suggested anyone. You wrote about me? Of course. What else am I going to write about? We always discuss what our kinner are doing. Wilma sat, not knowing what to do. If only they'd allow her to see Iris. She decided to bring up the subject again over dinner and see if she might wear them down. I'm still waiting for my cup of tea, Dot said. Wilma got up to make it. That evening, when they still wouldn't hear about her visiting Iris, there was only one thing Wilma could do. That night, when she went up to her bedroom, she packed a bag, and then she sat down to write her folks a note. The note said she was convinced Iris would return to the community, and she was going to bring her back. That, along with another letter in a week with a progress update on Iris, would buy her some time. Chapter 3 Finally, Wilma saw the phone box. It was outside a small convenience store. She stopped when she saw a car and a group of young men outside it. She moved further into the trees and bushes on the side of the road so she wouldn't be spotted, knowing her white cop and apron would be easy to see if she wasn't well concealed. They were calling out, throwing empty cans around. They were drunk. Wilma knew not to go near them. She waited patiently in the shadows. A while later, they got into the car. The driver spun their wheels, made a couple of fancy loops in the store's small parking lot, and then screeched up the road in the opposite direction. Wilma was thankful they'd gone. She moved with heavy legs toward the phone, hoping she wouldn't give birth right now in the middle of nowhere. Wilma pulled out a coin and the slip of paper with Iris's phone number and dialed. Iris answered on the second ring. Iris, it's me. 
What's wrong? I don't know where to start. I need you to come get me right now. There was a hesitation. Why? Just do it. I'll tell you everything when you get here. Wilma looked up the road, hoping the men wouldn't return. Hurry. I'm on my way. Where are you exactly? I'm at the store, two miles north of the house. Stay there and don't go anywhere. Iris ended the call. Where would I go? Wilma muttered to herself as she hurried back across the road. She found a tree with low branches she could hide behind if those men came back. Dark thoughts ran through her mind as she waited in the shadows. She pushed them away. Iris would help her. Older sisters always knew what to do. When she saw the headlights of a car several minutes later, she held her breath. It was Iris. When Iris got out of the car, Wilma moved out from the shadows. I'm over here. Iris hurried to her. What's happened? Wilma looked down at her belly, and Iris's eyes followed. Are you pregnant? Iris squealed. I'm just about to give birth. Right now? Not right this minute now, but I'm nearly due. You're hiding it well. I just kept making my clothes bigger. Iris took the bag from Wilma. Do they know? No, Wilma shook her head. Let's get out of here. Chapter Four On the way to her apartment, Iris wasn't talking much. Wilma had to wonder if her sister wasn't slightly envious of her pregnancy. Iris had developed crippling endometriosis in her late teens, and hysterectomy had followed. Their mother had told Iris that God was punishing her for being a horrible daughter. Iris left the community not long after. Thanks for getting me. We'll talk tomorrow. You look exhausted. I am a little. Wilma put her head back and closed her eyes. It didn't take long to get to Iris's apartment building. As Iris opened the door of the first floor apartment, she said, You have my bed. I'll take the couch. No, I can't do that to you. The couch will be fine. For once in your life, don't argue. You're sleeping in the bed. Iris walked through to the bedroom and placed Wilma's bag on a chest of drawers. Thanks. I owe you so much. It's fine. The bedroom was all pink and green with a floral quilt that covered the bed. Lamps on the nightstands gave the room a warm pink hue. This is beautiful. It's okay. Are you hungry? Wilma shook her head. I try not to eat before bed. It gives me indigestion. I think I just need to sleep. There's a fresh bottle of water on the nightstand. Thanks. Good night, Wilma. You know where I am if you need me. Try not to have the baby tonight. We both need the sleep. Wilma chuckled. Good night, Iris. Iris left her there, and Wilma sat on the bed. A bed had never felt so good after her two-mile jaunt. Then she saw the knapsack. She pushed herself to her feet, walked over, and opened the side pocket. She pulled out a bundle of letters from Gerald. She'd taken to getting the mail so her mother would never see them. She breathed out heavily and held her letters to her heart. She'd once had so much hope for a future with Gerald, and now she knew it had all been a fantasy, not something practical. The next morning, Iris brought food to Wilma on a tray. Wilma pushed herself up in bed. Wow, thanks for this. There was scrambled egg and toast and a glass of orange juice. Her sister remembered her favorite breakfast. Don't you have to work? Not today. I took the week off. How did you sleep? Thanks for doing that. I slept wonderfully. Wilma relaxed into the pillows that Iris had just placed behind her back. Thanks. You can help me figure out my life. Iris sat on the bed, offering a sympathetic look. 
What do you intend to do with the child? I can't keep it. I'm too young to have a baby. You could if you decide to. Wilma's voice rose. I can't. Of course I can't. Eat your food before it goes cold. Iris remained her usual calm self. Wilma carefully scooped some scrambled eggs onto the toast and cut herself a portion. You could leave the community, Iris suggested. Wilma swallowed her mouthful. I have no money. No nothing. I can't just leave. I don't want to leave. I belong there. I can't survive by myself. I'm too stupid. You're not. Don't believe what they tell you. Iris was talking about they as being their parents. It's true. If I wasn't so dumb, this wouldn't have happened. Iris's gaze flickered to Wilma's belly. I believe that God meant for this child to come into the world. The child has a life to live, a meaning and a purpose. Wilma took a mouthful of juice. I can't allow myself to think of the baby as mine. It would break me. Since I found out, I told myself I was carrying the baby for someone else, someone worthy of a child, not a dumb person like me. I can't be attached to it. All I want is for my life to go back to the way it was before. If Mom and Dot found out, they'd never accept you back. They're unreasonable and strict. Controlling is the word. Then you'd have to, let's not discuss it. Nothing will happen because I'm going to fix the mistake. Wilma piled more egg and toast onto her fork and took a second mouthful. You can't go back in time. You'll have to find a family for the baby. I'll look into finding an adoption agency if that's what you want. What if you take the child? Wilma stared into her sister's eyes. It was what she'd been thinking about ever since she'd found out. Iris had been depressed for the longest time about never being able to have a child. This is your chance. Maybe my baby is a gift from God to you. Besides, you can afford to raise a child. You must have some money set aside. Are you serious? I've never been more serious about anything in my life. I was going to suggest it, but with you wanting the child out of your life, how would that work? If I raise the child, do you want the child to think of you as his or her aunt? Wilma hung her head. Her eight years older sister had always been her support system. Even when Iris had left the community, nothing had changed. She'd be losing both her baby and her sister. Her comfort would be that her baby would have the best mother possible. You'll have to never see me again. I'll never contact you, and you can never contact me. Raise the child as your own. Never tell the child about me. That's the only stipulation I have. No, that's not realistic. We talk every week and see each other every other week. We can't do that. Iris, if you want my baby, that's what it's going to take. That's nonsense. We could meet up every few weeks so you could see the baby grow up. No one will have to know if that's the way you want it. You should be the aunt at the very least. Wilma put the knife and the fork back down on the plate. I've had enough. Please take the tray away. Iris lifted the tray off and set it at the other side of the bed. Wilma clenched her hands together so hard that her knuckles turned white. No, what you suggested won't work. As soon as the baby is born, you take it, and then I can never see you or the baby again. Iris's eyes grew wide. You never want to see me again in your whole life? It would be too hard for me to see the child. And if you're really serious about taking this baby, I am, as long as you're positive this is what you want. Wilma took hold of Iris's hand. 
I can't think of anybody in the world that I'd rather raise my child. You practically raised me. You showed me all the love that mom never did. I'm gonna go back to the community as though nothing ever happened. Iris inhaled sharply. What will you say when you get back? I had to tell them I was bringing you back with me. I'm surprised they believed that. I don't think they did. That's probably why they wouldn't allow me to go. I left a note on my bed telling them I was going to talk you into coming back. I said you were considering it. I'll have to tell them that when I got here, you'd changed your mind. Good luck with that. They'll never believe I was thinking of returning. They might doubt my story, but they'll never know for sure. So, what do you say, Iris? How do you feel about being a mother? It's something that I never thought would happen. I can't wait. As long as this is what you truly want. Is it? It would be the only thing I'd find satisfying right now. Iris covered her face with her hands. I can't believe this. It's all so sudden. It's settled. Can you have someone do adoption papers so I can sign something? I want you to be the mother in every possible way. Iris bounded to her feet. Wait a bit. Aren't you forgetting something? What? The father of the child. Who is he? Oh, him. Wilma's eyes drifted to the nightstand, taking in the pile of letters. He's someone. I know he's someone, but who? Wilma stammered, not able to say his name. I hope you've told him. Wilma's heart pumped hard. I will. I'll tell him after the baby's born. Iris shook her head. That changes everything for me. It doesn't. He won't want the baby. He's too busy. He's just a rich Englisher. I don't know what he saw in me, but it's over. She didn't tell Iris that he'd come to the house looking for her. Neither did she tell Iris about all the letters Gerald was sending her. That's wrong. You'll need to tell him. He might want to take the baby and raise the child. It's his legal right as the father. He won't be able to because you will be the legal mother by the time I tell him. Iris, this will be your only chance in your whole lifetime to be a mother. Don't turn your back. Okay, I might be setting myself up for a legal battle, though, if this man wants to take the baby. Don't be so negative. Iris smiled. Thank you for giving me the chance of being a mother. When they told me I could never have children, I was devastated. I know. Wilma recalled Mom's horrible words to Iris. You can always change your mind, Wilma. Once you see the baby... No, I won't change my mind. Once you hold the baby, you might feel different. You can move in with me. We'll get a bigger place. I'll help you. Thanks for the offer but that's not what I want. I've made up my mind. I want you to have the child, and I'm going back home. I thank you for taking me in, Iris. You're the only one who knows about this. You didn't even tell Ada? I haven't seen much of her. She's so busy with her little ones. She's still my closest friend. That will never change. Will you tell her? No because then I'll be talking about it, and she'll ask questions. Once my baby's born, I'll need to put the whole thing out of my mind as soon as I can. I'll have to get back to thinking about my future. Do you think that's practical? Wilma wiped away the stray tear that fell down her cheek. It's the only thing I can do. I've got no husband. No one in their community had a child out of wedlock. Not that anyone knew about. She wouldn't be allowed to stay at home. And apart from that, where would she get money to raise the child? She had no skills to get a job. And even if she did, who would look after the child while she worked? You don't have to decide yet. I'm being practical, Iris. 
I've had months to think about this. Why didn't you tell me sooner? You've had so many opportunities. I didn't want to tell anyone. I waited until the last minute. I'm glad you called me. One week later, Wilma gave birth to a seven-pound baby boy. Iris had managed to locate a midwife who did home births. That was Wilma's wish. Everything had gone well. You did it, Wilma, Iris said, looking down at the 15-minute-old baby cradled in her arms. It had also been Wilma's wish that Iris be the first one to hold the child. Might I have a chance to hold him now? Wilma asked. Why don't you see if he wants to nurse? The midwife asked Wilma. Wilma frowned. They'd told the midwife what the situation was. No. The midwife went about cleaning up while Iris passed the baby to Wilma. She stared down at his small pink face as he looked around the room. He was perfect. He had ten fingers and ten toes. How she wished her situation was different. It was hard to be strong right now, but she knew the baby would be better off with Iris. She was only a child herself. You can call him what you want, but he looks like a Joseph to me. When Iris kept quiet, Wilma guessed she might already have a name picked out. She didn't need to know what it was. When I think about him, he'll be Joseph. Iris put a gentle hand on her shoulder. Chapter 5 The next day, Wilma knew she had to go home or risk getting attached to the baby. The midwife had given her the name of a doctor in case she needed one. I'll contact Gerald and let him know. That's the baby's father. Wilma, that's the first time you've said his name. Give him my phone number. The best thing to do is come clean with what's happened. I'll sit down with him and tell him about the adoption and see how he takes it. Thanks, Iris. The child must also never know I'm his mother. You must raise him as your own. Never let him know any different. We're sisters. He might even look like you. I'll do all that you say, Wilma. I will. If this man wants a legal battle, I'll do my best to keep the child. I'll be fighting the battle for both of us, you and me. That's the best I can do. Wilma had kept her word and passed on Iris's phone number to Gerald. He was shocked when she told him about the baby. She had to confess her lie, that she wasn't really marrying an Amish man. After her phone call to Gerald, she wrote him a letter to fully explain her actions, in that letter, she'd included Iris's phone number again, in case he'd lost it. In time, Wilma had blocked everything out about her son. The child's father had kept away from her, and so too had Iris. Her plan had worked, and life had gone back to a new normal. Six years passed, and Wilma had never liked another man. A dark cloud had hung over her since she arrived back from Iris's place. She'd confessed her sin many a time, and yet never felt forgiven. All she could do was accept that she was, because the scriptures said so. One day, she'd get away from her parents. One day, she'd have a better life. What she hoped and prayed for was a large family and a loving husband. While Wilma and her mother were weeding the vegetable garden one day, her mother asked, do you remember how I said I'd find you a husband? Wilma remembered that day well. That was years ago, Mom. I thought you'd forgotten. I was waiting to see if you'd find a man by yourself. Why aren't you more interested? Do you want to be a burden on us forever? Her mother continued to pull out the weeds, tossing them in a pile. Thanks, Mom. Is that what I am? That's what you are but you can fix it. I have found you someone. Who is it? Her mother stood up straight. Josiah Baker. Wilma knew him. He was older than she was and a widower. He owned a small apple orchard and had three young children. 
Wilma dropped her metal weeding tool and rose to her feet. Her mother continued. It's been a while now since Eleanor died. He'd be looking for a new wife to help run his house and look after his kinner. What do you say? Wilma twisted her mouth to one side. She'd never considered him before. He was tall, handsome, and he always seemed happy. Maybe. Her mother's jaw dropped. What does that mean? Mom would get suspicious if Wilma didn't have the right response. Marrying anyone was the last thing she could think of, but that was what was needed. It was time to make a change. She didn't want to live with her parents forever. I'd have to get to know him first. He never talks to me. What should I do about that? Bake him a pie and take it to him. You could do worse. His apple orchard is doing well, and he'll treat you right. He was heartbroken when Eleanor died, and now their poor kinner have no mutter. I know. It is sad. I'll do it. You will? I mean, I'll try to get to know him. We both have to be fond of each other before we marry. Her mother clasped her hands to her heart. That's all I'm asking. I suggest it because I want you to have a family. Your father and I are getting old, and you aren't that old at all. Too old to have a child living at home. Iris is a lost cause. She'll never return to the community. It was a waste of time years ago when you went to fetch her. I know that now, but I had to try. Wilma licked her dry lips. Let's not talk about her. Fine with me. We can pray that Josiah likes you, and then we might get a miracle. Eleanor was beautiful, but he might take a plain wife this time. Who knows? That made Wilma feel awful about herself. First thing tomorrow, Wilma, we'll bake a pie, and you can take it to him. Yeah, Mom, sounds good. Wilma couldn't think of anything more embarrassing. Taking men pies was something the older ladies did, or the desperate ones. At nearly 23, with her plain looks, she had officially become one of the desperate ones. Later that afternoon, Wilma managed to slip away from her chores and visited her best friend, Ada. Ada had her older children mind the younger ones in the living room, so she and Wilma could talk in the kitchen. Once they were settled with hot tea and cookies, Wilma said, Mom wants me to marry Josiah Baker. Wilma was too embarrassed to tell Ada what else her mother said in that hurtful conversation. That's right! Eleanor died some time ago now. I never considered him for you. He's a bit older, but some women don't mind an older man. Do you? What do you think of him? If you like him, I like him. You'll have a ready-made family if you marry him. I think you should go ahead and marry him. Wilma laughed. Ada always had definite opinions, and at times she could be pushy. I do like the idea of that. His children are delightful. It'll be no problem being close with the little girl, but the boys are older, and they'd still remember their mother. What if they don't accept me? Of course they will. The main thing you'll have to worry about is whether you'll get along with Josiah. He seems nice. I've never really talked to him alone, only in a group. Mom wants me to take him a pie. Good idea. Men love food. Your mother's got the right idea. I'd feel silly going there with a pie. And what if there's another visitor there at the same time? What if it's another woman? How embarrassing would that be? Wilma, you're thinking of problems that don't even exist. If he's the one God's got for you, then you'll be the only one there. I think he'd be a good choice for you. He's mature, and he'd know what to expect from a marriage. It's not always easy, and he'd know that if he's got any sense. I guess so. Wilma was relieved that Ada approved of Josiah. I look forward to talking to him alone. When did you say you were going there? Tomorrow. I'm so nervous just thinking about it. 
Oh, do stop by and tell me exactly what happened. I definitely will. I'll come here afterward instead of going home right away. Chapter 6 Wilma pulled up at the Baker apple orchard with a peach pie on the buggy seat next to her. When she got out of the buggy, the three Baker children ran up to her. She already knew them from the meetings. Earl was the eldest, then Mark, and then Florence. Wilma guessed Florence to be around four or five, and Earl was maybe ten. Mark was nearly as tall as Earl, so he would have been close to his age. Hello, Wilma said to them before she had a chance to retrieve the pie. Is your father around somewhere? We'll get him, Earl said, turning on his heel and calling out for his father. Mark ran to catch up with him while Florence stayed and took hold of her hand. Wilma kneeled, so she was the same height as Florence. You know me from the meetings. Florence wrapped her arms around her neck, and Wilma's heart melted. She looked up and saw Josiah walking toward her, followed by the boys. She stood up. Hello, Josiah. Wilma? He stood there, smiling at her. Mom, Florence said. It's not Mom, the oldest boy snapped. Josiah came to the rescue. I'm sorry, Wilma. He turned to his children. You three can have a break from your chores and play ball. I didn't mean she was Mom. I meant, never mind. The boys ran behind the house. Josiah looked down at his daughter. Florence, why don't you go with your brothers? I want to stay with Wilma. Miss Wilma, I told you to call the ladies Miss before their names. Now do what I say. Florence stared at her father and then walked back toward the house. She's strong-willed, he said to Wilma. There's nothing wrong with that. She's a delightful child. She must have a special place in your heart. He smiled. All my kinner do. She was pleased to hear that. Would you care to take a walk with me? I'd love that. Wilma couldn't believe how easy it was. There was no awkward asking why she was there, and neither did she have to tell him about the pie she'd brought. The pie? She'd clean forgotten. Oh, I brought you a pie. His face lit up. I love pies. It's in the buggy. It'll be okay there while I show you some apple trees. Wilma chuckled as she kept up with his long strides. What kind of apple trees? I've got so many. I've been collecting different varieties. Some are rare. She looked up at the trees that were in full spring blossom. I can't wait to see them. I've got big plans to make this one of the biggest apple orchards for miles around. My father started the orchard, and I took over from him. My life pretty much revolves around apples. As they walked over the carpet of fallen petals, she asked, How much land do you have? Many acres. Ninety-two, to be exact, but that's not counting the land I recently bought next door and a parcel of land at the back. The land next door has a house on it. Two, if you count the old stone building, that's just a shack, really. It must be hundreds of years old, built by the early settlers. What are you going to do with the house? You don't need two, do you? No. I only need the one, since there's only the four of us now. His voice tapered off with a hint of sadness. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to make you think about Eleanor. Please don't be sorry. I think about her every day. Every time I see my children, I see her. I hear her voice when the wind rustles through the branches of the apple trees. I see her smiling face in the clouds. Wilma knew she could never replace Eleanor. Her mother had made a big mistake sending her there. If I lost someone, I'd want to put them out of my mind completely, or I'd cry every single day, 
he faced her. I see sadness in your eyes, Wilma. Who have you lost that made your heart so heavy? Your gross mommy or your gross daddy, maybe? Tears flooded down Wilma's face when she thought about the little tiny baby boy she'd held in her arms. She hadn't even been under the same roof with him for a whole day before she left him. The year's worth of barriers she'd built against his memory burst through like a dam bursting its walls. Both hands covered her face. Josiah rubbed her arm gently and kept silent. She'd kept the secret in for so long that she couldn't hold it anymore. Throwing aside her mother's advice about not being herself, she told him something she vowed would never pass her lips. I had a child. She looked at him to see how he'd take the news. He seemed a little shocked. When? Six years back. I had him in my arms and knew I couldn't give him a good life. I gave him to Iris, my sister, to raise, to adopt as her own. The only way I could shield my heart was to tell Iris she could never contact me again, and I never wanted to see the child. He was a boy. I held him once, and while he was in my arms, a name came to me, Joseph. I'm so sorry, Wilma. That must be so tough. I try to block out everything from that part of my life. It's not easy sometimes, especially when I see babies, or when I see boys about his age. What about the father? An Englisher, a mistake. I was lying to him the whole time. I told him I was 22. I was only 17. Somewhere, I have a son, Josiah. She wiped away her tears. No one knows, not even Ada. I guess your parents don't know either. Wilma shook her head. I didn't dare tell them. They'd have thrown me out of the house. I don't know why I'm telling you. As much as I try to block him out, how can you turn your back on a part of your heart? That tells you what kind of person I am. There, she had been honest with him, and with that honesty came relief. His eyes misted over. We've both suffered loss. She continued to cry, and he put a comforting arm around her. Then she leaned into him and sobbed while his strong arms encircled her. When she stopped crying, he said, I'm honored you felt comfortable enough to tell me about something so close to your heart. Wilma stared up into his eyes as the dappled sunlight danced on his face. You make me feel as though I can trust you. The corners of his lips turned up slightly. You can. They shared a moment in between the safety of the rows of apple trees, away from prying eyes. Without him having to say too much, she knew he accepted her with all her faults, with all her past mistakes. She could feel it, could see it in his eyes. Right then, she felt they were the only two people in the world. It was as though time had stood still just for them. Wilma was the first to look away, and then Josiah said, Let's get you back to the house. Can you stay for lunch? I've got some corned beef left over, and I can make some sandwiches. She managed to smile. Thank you. I'd like that. When they were nearly back at the house, the three children ran over to them. For a moment, Wilma got a glimpse of what it would be like to marry the kind and caring Josiah and be part of his family, there had been no judgment when she'd told him about Joseph. They took the peach pie inside, and there Wilma helped him make the sandwiches while the three children sat at the table. Do you do everything around here yourself? Wilma asked. With the children's help, I do. The only extra help we have is at harvest time. It can't be easy. 
He chuckled. It's not. That'll have to change as I increase the size of the orchard. They ate their sandwiches at the long kitchen table. The children bubbled over with enthusiastic talk about the games they had just played. When the children were excused, they wasted no time running outside to continue playing. They get along so well together, Wilma said as she carried the plates to the sink, just like me and my sister used to be. Leave the dishes, Wilma. No, I'll wash them, and then I'll go. I've taken up far too much of your time already. She filled the sink with sudsy water. Sensing him behind her, she turned off the tap and turned around. I'm sorry about my outburst before. It's fine. I will keep your secret to myself. I was going to ask you to do that. I thought you would. Do you have to go so soon, Wilma? She was a little shocked he wanted her to stay. Surely he wouldn't think she was a suitable marriage prospect after what she'd confessed. I have to get home to help Mom with a few things. Would you come back tomorrow? Her mouth dropped open. Do you want me to? I wouldn't have asked if I didn't. She stared into his kind blue eyes. Maybe Gott was finally allowing something good to happen. What time? Any time that suits you. I could be here at eleven, she said. Eleven it is. I'll be waiting. Leave the dishes, Wilma, he repeated. Nay, they won't take long. Wilma turned away from him and washed the dishes. While she did so, he grabbed a dish towel, ready to dry them. Wilma was so excited by how well they'd gotten along that, instead of going directly home, she took the road to Ada's house, as she'd promised to do. Ada rushed out toward her. They're sleeping. Wilma stepped down from the buggy. All of them? The older ones are at my mother's, but the three younger ones are here. I don't think it's happened before that they've been asleep all at the same time. Ada grabbed the reins out of Wilma's hands and slung them over the hitching post. Shall I go so you can have some peace? Wilma asked. Nay, we can have a nice talk without interruptions. Wilma stepped down from the buggy. I've got some exciting news. Let's sit on the porch and you can tell me there. We'll just have to keep our voices down. Wilma walked up the steps of the porch. She'd found it hard not being envious of the life Ada had since she'd gotten married. She had a lovely home, and Samuel was a wonderful and devoted husband. The pair suited each other so well, and they had seven children. Ada was a little older than Wilma, but that didn't stop them from being best friends. Ada directed Wilma which chair to sit in, and then she sat down next to her. Now, tell me your news. I did as my mother said, and I took Josiah a pie. What happened? Tell me everything from start to finish. Wait, I should make us some hot chocolate. Nay, it'll wake the children if I go into the kitchen. I'm fine, Ada. I don't need anything. Laughter bubbled up inside Wilma. She was in such a good mood. I could do with a cop, but go ahead. I'll restrain myself for now. He asked me to come back tomorrow. Oh, Wilma, you've just spoiled it for me. I said, tell me the start, and you've just told me the finish. He would have said that at the end, wouldn't he? That's right. Wilma swallowed hard. She couldn't tell her dear friend everything, because then she'd have to tell her the secret. No one could know. Tell me from the beginning. You've spoiled it for me. Go ahead. Wilma proceeded to tell Ada everything that happened, leaving out the part about her crying and Josiah holding her in his arms under the romantic canopy of apple blossoms. She was falling for him already. I'm happy for you, Ada said. Tinka, I can hardly believe it. Do you think you'll marry him? Wilma laughed with joy and then clapped a hand over her mouth so the children wouldn't hear. I do hope so. I've not met anyone as nice. The only thing that bothers me is, what if he's still in love with his wife? His deceased wife? Ada asked. 
Yeah. Oh, Wilma, I said that so you'd see how silly that sounds. It's not silly. How will I measure up to the love he had for Eleanor? I'm sure, well, he said some things about how he misses her. You left that part out. That was unwise of him if he's looking for a wife. Maybe he's not. Ada tapped a finger on her chin. But it fitted in with the conversation we were having. It got quite personal for both of us. Oh, that's right. And please don't ask me to tell you what was said. Wilma hung her head, thinking her friend would be cross with her for not telling her all the details. Instead, when she looked back up, Ada was smiling. That tells me you really like him, and more than just a little. I don't know. Wilma was almost too scared to admit to herself or Ada how much she already liked him, in case things didn't work out. See how you feel tomorrow. If you don't know how you feel after that, it's how he feels as well. Like you said, does he want a second wife? He'd need one. He's got three kinner, and then there's the orchard. His life would be easier if he married again. Wilma nodded and didn't say anything because she knew Ada wouldn't like what she was thinking. She didn't want to be someone's convenience. She wanted someone who genuinely had feelings for her. Gone were her hopes of a real love match after what she'd been through. She didn't deserve to be blessed in that way. Even though she'd confessed her sins, she still didn't feel the same as she had before she'd met Gerald. You might have a wedding after all. I don't know why you couldn't find anyone before now. Wilma shrugged her shoulders, blocking out the image of Gerald Braithwaite. I'm not sure. No one has appealed to me. Chapter 7 The next day, Wilma took a while to get dressed. Her mother was nearly as excited as she was and carefully pressed Wilma's best dress to make sure her daughter looked neat and tidy. While she got ready, her mother gave her so much advice about what to say and what not to say that it all left Wilma's head. Wilma's head was high in the clouds, and she hadn't slept at all. She'd spent all night thinking about Josiah and playing out scenes as though they were already married. She'd love his children with all the love in her heart that she'd never gotten to give her own baby boy. When Wilma was back at the Baker Apple Orchard, the children ran out to meet her. Josiah called them back and had them wait on the porch. Wilma approached them with a big smile. It was nice to be made so welcome. When they exchanged greetings, Mark grabbed one of Wilma's hands while Florence grabbed the other. The two youngest children led her inside. Why are you here again? Earl, the eldest, asked. Because I enjoyed myself so much yesterday that I wanted to see you again. That made Earl smile. Dots made us lunch. We're going to have a picnic, Mark told her. That's exciting, Wilma replied, exchanging a smile with Josiah. Josiah laughed. You lot won't let me get a word in. He said to Wilma, I was going to ask you about that first. How do you feel about a picnic lunch down by the river? I'd love that. We can take my buggy. He raised his eyebrows. Only if I drive. Of course. The river was only a mile to the north, and all the way, Wilma couldn't stop smiling. Josiah had gone to a lot of trouble. He would have seen how well she got on with the children, too. This was really happening. After they ate their sandwiches and fruit, Josiah sent the children off to feed the ducks with some leftover bread. That'll keep them quiet for a while, he whispered to Wilma as the children ran to the water's edge. You've done a wonderful job with them, Josiah. They're so happy. Not all of them. Sometimes Earl stays in his room for hours and won't come out. Other days, he seems fine. I didn't know. Josiah nodded. 
He's taken his mother's death harder than the others. Who knows what's going on in his mind? I'm so sorry. I feel sad for your whole family. He looked down. It's been an adjustment in so many ways, ways that I never even would have thought of. The last thing I thought of was that she'd die before me and die so young. I never even gave it a thought. Florence is only young. She probably won't even remember her, and that breaks my heart. He looked up at her. I'm sorry. I shouldn't be talking about this. I told myself this morning not to talk about Eleanor today. Wilma smiled. It's okay. We both feel comfortable enough to tell each other things. She'll always be a part of your life and a part of their life. Nothing will change that. You're a kind and sensible woman, Wilma. I don't know why some man hasn't begged you to marry him. How do you know one hasn't? Maybe a few of them have. Have they? She laughed. No. I find it hard to get close to people. According to her mother, she was plain and boring, and that was why. I'm the same. I never thought I would meet another woman I could talk to until yesterday. Wilma gulped and looked away. He continued, everything with you is so easy, so natural. Do you feel the same? Wilma's heart pounded hard. I do. I feel, the only word I can think of is comfortable. I don't know you that well, but in a way, I feel that I do. You make me feel a certain way, Wilma, and I can't describe it. Try. Okay. He gave an embarrassed laugh. You make me feel as though I want to protect you and look after you. I want to give you a better life. A tear trickled down her cheek. She wanted to be cared for by him. Sniffing, she wiped away her tear. Josiah was all the things she'd liked about Gerald, wrapped up in a better and more suitable package. I've made you cry. I didn't mean to. It's all your nice words. I'd like you to be happy, Wilma. I don't think your life has been happy. Neither has mine for the last couple of years. It's been okay. I'm not unhappy. Would you think it's too soon if I ask you to marry me? Wilma stared into his face. Was he serious? He wasn't smiling, so it couldn't have been a joke. Are you asking me? Only if you think we're not moving too quickly. And what if I think things are too quick? He smiled. Then I'll wait and ask you another day. Joy bubbled over in Wilma's heart, and she nodded. He lowered his head without taking his eyes from hers. What does that mean? There's something about you, Josiah. I knew it the moment I told you what I've never told anyone else. I will marry you if you think it's the right timing for you and your kinner. If it's not, we can wait. He took hold of her hand. My children already adore you. My dream would be for us to have many more children. I'll enlarge the house when each one arrives so they can each have their own room. Wilma laughed. I'd love that. We might end up with a large house. And I'll make us another kitchen. We can have two kitchens. She loved the way his face lit up when he spoke about their future. That would be wunderbar. I do like canning and making jams and sauces. A second kitchen would be perfect. It feels right. I'd like to tell the children tonight, and tomorrow I'll see the bishop, and we'll make a date for our wedding. Wilma sat there in shock. Is that all right? he asked. She found reassurance in his eyes. Everything would be all right from now on. More than all right. When should I tell my folks? I'll have my sister look after the children tomorrow. What if I come at three in the afternoon and we can tell them together? That would be perfect. 
we'll be so happy, and then plan to bring the children back for the evening meal. He gave a nod and squeezed her hand, just as the children ran back, asking for the ducks. Chapter 8 One year later, in the springtime, Wilma gave birth to a baby girl. Wilma and Josiah had gotten married a month after they met. Wilma's prayers were answered when she fell pregnant soon after. Now she rested in bed an hour after she'd given birth, holding her newborn while Josiah sat next to her, looking on. As much as she didn't want to, she couldn't help comparing her two births. This birth was easier and so much faster than her first. Perhaps that was because her body had known when the first child was released, she'd have to leave him. Her body held on to him for as long as it could. She couldn't help wondering how Iris and Joseph were getting along, and also wondering what had become of Gerald. You did so well, Wilma. She looked up at the husband she adored and secretly felt she didn't deserve. Pushing her past further away, she said, You were here encouraging me, that's why. Never leave me. I'll always be with you. He leaned over and kissed her forehead. Danka for our baby girl. She's so beautiful, just like you. Wilma smiled. He was always giving her compliments. She looked down at the baby, who she'd been told was just under six pounds. Even though she was tiny, she wasn't wrinkled or thin. She was a complete and perfect child. Wilma knew her mother and father were excitedly waiting to hear whether she had a boy or a girl. They could wait. Her life was now as perfect as she could have imagined. Let the children in. They've been waiting for so long to meet their sister. Nay, not just yet. Let's enjoy this moment together for a little longer. They can come in soon, and then you must rest. Josiah, we still haven't agreed on a name. I've been thinking of a different one, one we haven't mentioned yet, but I don't know what you'll think about it. It's Mercy. Mercy? I love it. That's perfect. It represents the mercy God has shown to both of us. Mercy it is, then. Wilma kissed the top of her baby's bald head. She breathed in the fresh newborn scent. Hello, Mercy. Nice to meet you. I never thought I'd be happy again, Wilma, until the day you came to my door with a peach pie. She looked up at him. You remember what kind of pie it was? I haven't forgotten anything about that day. It was one of the nicest days of my life, only surpassed by the day you became my wife, and of course also by today, the birth of our first child together. Wilma smiled down at their baby. Holding this child took away some of the hurt over the other child she held deep in the corner of her heart that no one but Josiah had ever seen. She was glad Josiah never mentioned him. Somehow, Josiah knew she didn't and couldn't talk about him or that time in her life when he came into the world. She looked up at Josiah. The day you asked me to marry you, you said you wanted to give me a better life. He smiled. I remember. That's just what you did. Nay, Wilma. It's you who gave me and my kinner a better life. They're thriving. He always knew what to say. I love you, Wilma, in case you were wondering. Once again, Wilma smiled up at him. How could I wonder that? You tell me every single day. I love you, too. Shall I let the children in now? I can hear them scuffling at the door. Yes, Mercy would love to meet her brothers and her sister. While Josiah got up to let the children in, Wilma offered up a silent prayer of thanks for Mercy, her husband, and the three stepchildren she loved as her own. Then she took a moment to think of Joseph. 
she knew he'd be thriving because Iris would see to it that he was well-loved. This has been A Better Amish Life, a special edition of the Amish Bonnet Sisters, written by Samantha Price, narrated by Stephanie Dillard. Copyright 2021 by Samantha Price. Production Copyright 2021 by Samantha Price.